And good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks to uh, Mark and, and Eric and the team at OTTX for having me and allowing me to speak with you all today. And uh, we are, uh, this is a session, not a presentation. Hopefully um, there'll be some interactivity with the session. Uh, Eric, you're gonna correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, the session's gonna be broken into three parts and we're gonna lead each part um, with a poll question. Is that still happening, Eric? That's the plan, yeah, we'll see how it works. So we're gonna we're gonna lead uh, each session or each part of the session with a poll question that will be relevant to that particular part of the session, and then we're gonna break after each section and and answer a couple of questions and maybe look at the poll. Um, and so yeah, so here we go. I'm gonna try to share my screen and see what happens here. Uh, give me one second. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. Looks great. Okay, fantastic. So um, the name of the presentation or the session, is, as Eric said, is Industry Dynamics and the Impact on the Organizations and Leaders and the Careers of People. Um, so uh, we're going to look at the industry and how changes in the industry can have an impact on, on all or parts of an organization, um, but especially individuals within the organization, their career paths and, and the career paths of those people they may impact. Um, we're going to do it in three parts, as I mentioned before. Uh, we're going to look at some history of the industry. Uh, and that'll be the first part. Then we're going to take a look at the current state um, of the industry and future possibilities. And then, so that'll be the second part. And the third part will be um, centered around what it means to us um, as individuals based on our goals and our objectives and our desires as, as individuals. So um, why start with history? Well, there's an old saying that goes, uh, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Um, it's a nice saying, it's, it's really not a cliche, um, but for me, it's a very negative view of, of history. And I, I'd rather instead take a, a more positive approach, which is the past is where you learn lessons, and the future is where you apply the lessons. So uh, again, it's it's kind of saying the same thing as that you know doomed part, um, but it's a more positive look at it. Is there's there's so much we can and need to learn um, from what has happened, um, but we need to be able to apply it to the future in order to affect the future. Um, so. The uh, film and TV, or we'll call it the content industry, has been a growth industry since the 50s. And there's no denying that. Um, much of the growth of the industry has been driven by choice um, and by a change in the industry uh, from an environment where the content was very much controlled and how people used the content, when they could see it, how they could see it, was very much controlled by the people who created it or their partners. Um, over the past 50 years, the environment has slowly been changing to one where there is choice. And the public has had an expanding amount of choice in how they consume content. Now, there are Parts of 
uh, the past 50 years that are considered uh, monumental or major changes in this change from control to choice. But I would argue that it's really been, um, it's, it's been constant and it's also been uh, more gradual than people understand. But it's really been the result of two things, um, technology and changes in business models. So um, the biggest changes in the industry has happened when those two things have converged. Um, sometimes there's some change affected just by technology, sometimes just by changes in business models. Where those two things have converged have caused the greatest uh, changes during the past, uh, call it 50 years. Uh, I want to start, though, before we get into this, with a basic premise about the industry. And that is most of the change and most of the growth in the industry has taken place after the theatrical window. That there has been very little change in the theatrical part of the business um, certainly in the past 25 years. And one might look at the numbers and say, well, how can you say that's true? Um, and I happen to have some numbers here. I'm not going to show them on the screen. But in 1995, the U.S. box office was $5.3 billion. And in 2019, the U.S. box office was $11.2 billion. And you would say, well, how can you say there's no change and there's no growth there? Well, it's really a matter of looking at use, not dollars. Those $5.3 billion were generated in 1995 by selling 1.2 billion tickets. The $11.2 billion in box office for 2019 was generated by selling 1.2 billion tickets. So the growth in the theatrical part of the business has only been a result of um, price inflation, but not uh, business expansion. And one could argue actually that business has contracted uh, because in 1995, the population of the US was 265 million people. This past year, it was 325 million people. So actually on a per, uh, per consumer basis or population basis, there's actually less tickets being sold. So all of the change, all of the growth of the industry has happened post the theatrical. So we're gonna hold that aside, at least for the historical part of the conversation. And if we look at the past 25 years, um, and we're using 25 years for a number of reasons, but not least of which is uh, all of our careers will last at least that long. Um, most people will work, you know, probably 40 plus years in their career, whether it's in one industry or another. But, you know, with it, something that happens within 25 years is going to happen within the scope of, of someone's career. So we're going to look at from 1995 until the present day and looking at the history. Um, and what we'll see and what we're going to explore is those 25 years and five-year cycles. So pre-1995, um, the content industry was built on a, a premise, really, of controlled consumer dissatisfaction. And uh, I, the typical example of that is the video stores, which obviously video was a huge growth business um, in the 90s. And, but pre-1995, uh, for anyone here that was old enough to experience it, um, and that may not be everybody, but pre-1995, you went into a video store, um, and unless you were there very early in the evening and very early in the weekend, you probably weren't going to get what you went in there for. Uh, there were only a few copies of the newest releases, uh, but you went into the video store for a reason, 
And uh, if you didn't couldn't get a copy of the new release, you generally didn't then leave with nothing. You left with something else, some older title, something else that you weren't necessarily looking for. Uh, but the whole business was based on controlled consumer dissatisfaction. Um, you could say the same thing about the TV business at the time because uh, there weren't nearly as many channels. Um, cable was just growing. Satellite was not yet a distribution method, so you did not have that. Um, so even in the TV side, there was controlled consumer dissatisfaction. Um, for our industry, that changed um, in the second half of the 90s when the studios and the major uh, video rental stores uh, came upon an agreement to go into copy depth and revenue sharing. So there was a change in business model, um, and that was the revenue sharing aspect. And that resulted in copy depth, which removed controlled consumer dissatisfaction, instead trying to create a business model on consumer satisfaction, knowing that consumer choice outside of the video store, <clears throat> excuse me, and outside of studio created content was starting to expand. So that's the first, the first five year cycle. The next five year cycle was 2001 to 2005. This is when DVD adoption took off uh, in the US and quite honestly, globally. Um, it, the DVD obviously was um, uh, introduced in 97, but from 97 to 2000, uh, there were only about 5.6 million DVD players sold uh, it was really 2001 where it really started to expand. And by 2005, nearly 75% of homes had a DVD player. So DVD adoption changed the industry. Um, it was obviously a new technology, but it was also a huge change in a business model because the companies, especially the studios driving the DVD business, wanted to change consumers from renters of movies to buyers of movies following a book business model. And we can have a whole different and long discussion about that at another time. Um, from 2006 to 2010, the next five year cycle, uh, this is when uh, DVD adoption plateaued. Um, the new, next cycle of this Blu-ray um, was really just starting and what really happened and the big part of the cycle was that internet-based interaction with consumers started. And this was both on the physical side with the growth of, of dot-com sites for physical media, as well as uh, the introduction of uh, internet-based electronic transactions. We had had um, pay-per-view, uh, through satellite and cable services, but really the internet-based uh, VOD platform started during this five-year cycle. Next five-year cycle uh, was really driven by the proliferation of internet platforms. Um, and we all know there are uh, numbers of them now. And so, you know, that's the next five-year cycle. And the most recent five-year cycle was driven by... Um, and the growth was created through distribution platforms now becoming content creators and owners, uh, as well as video mobility. Really, prior to 2015, um, while there were portable video devices, uh, there wasn't quite the use of video in a mobile context as exists today. And the bulk of that growth and the bulk of that change in consumer habit has happened in the past five years. Um, now, with the benefit of hindsight, we can identify these five cycles that happened in the past 25 years. But one would easily understand um, while you were in these cycles, um, that within each cycle, the visibility at the beginning of the cycle 
to what the business would look like at the end of the five year cycle was not very clear to too many people. Uh, so, you know, it's really, we can identify these cycles now, but if someone said to you in 1997 that they knew what the business was going to look like in 2019 um, and they were right, well, let's just say that person doesn't exist. Um, you know, because there is nobody that in 1997 could have envisioned all of these things that changed in these five-year cycles and for the business to be where it is. Um, so the thing that we want to understand is that the growth of the business has come from changes in the business. And as I said before, those changes have been incremental yet constant. And, you know, in the previous session with Teresa, someone asked about change. And, um, you know, she talked about change um, very eloquently and, and with some great advice. And one thing I would reemphasize is that um, change is never easy. But change is almost always required in order for growth to occur. Um, and that successful change is usually driven by successful leaders. And so it, it is important to understand that, um, you know, changes are happening. There is no question that changes will continue to happen in this industry. And you know what, for that, we're very lucky. Um, you know, there's a lot of industries that don't change very much. Uh, either don't grow very much, they're called commodities, um, or they get replaced. So we're, we are very fortunate to be in an industry that, that does, um, get the benefit of constant change. So that's, um, that's the first part, Eric. So I don't know how you want to, how you're going to put the poll up there, or if you're just going to talk to it. Oh, I am the all powerful Oz, Stephen. I can make it happen. So um, we have a poll and we're going to throw it up on the screen and give you all um, 20, 30 seconds or so to answer it. Uh, and so you'll see it now, please. This is an uh, anonymous poll, by the way. So um, go ahead and let us know what you think. is kind of cool. I can see the numbers going um, up and down across the um, questions that we have. Thanks everybody for jumping in on this. All right, good. It looks like we're up just a few more. It's funny, Stephen, I can remember this. There's probably a number of people who don't remember what it was like going into a, a video store, but I had a clear marching orders from my wife about having to pick up the latest release. And um, invariably, I would kind of put that off as I tended to do um, and end up at the video store. And of course, you know, as you mentioned, all of the copies of whatever it was movie that I was had to, had to, I was sent to go get wasn't weren't there anymore. So I had to come back with something else. Um, and shamefully show it to her. That this is what we're watching this weekend. Um, no longer the case. Anyway, so it looks like we're in good shape here with the poll. Thanks everybody for answering this and I'm going to now share the results. So can you see those, Stephen? I can see those. All right. Um, so there's probably nothing in here that's that shocking to me. Um, but I think the thing that we wanted to point out in the poll is, is a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, all of these choices are available to us and, and to the consumers now. And, uh, you know, as I said, 
you know, early on and, and even in pre-1995, that was not the environment of this business. The environment of this business was um, we're going to tell you when you can see it and we're going to tell you for how long you're going to see it there. And, and we're going to put content on a platform. Maybe it's in theaters and you're not going to be able to see it anywhere else but there. And then we're going to put it on TV, but we're going to tell you exactly when you're going to see it. And that's the only time you can see it. And, and things changed, obviously. And like I say, they changed gradually. Um, and a lot of the things that have occurred have led us to this day, right? Which is if we want to view content, you know, film, TV content, these are all the choices we have today. Um, and not only do we have these choices, but in almost all of these platforms, we have the choice as to where we will do it. Um, when in the past, obviously, uh, some of our choices were tied to a, uh, physical location or a physical structure. Um, so Eric, I don't know if you want to take a couple questions real quick on this before we get to the next spot. Um, if anybody uh, has questions about history, uh, I would limit it to the history we just talked about because I'm only good at certain types of history outside of industry history. If you want to ask me about the Civil War, I could probably answer some questions. Um, you know, outside of that, don't ask me about art history. Yeah, um, so we'd love to take some questions uh, to this point. Um, if you've uh, got anything on your mind, we can um, cover it right now. Uh, I don't see that we have any meeting. And you know what, Stephen, I'd say, why don't we just press on and um, we'll, uh, we'll take questions as we go. Okay. All right. Then, uh, so, so now we've looked at history. And, and now in this section, what we want to look at is what's happening now and what are um, future possibilities. And I would emphasize the future possibilities part for, for exactly the reason that I expressed before, that you know at the beginning of any of those five-year cycles, very few, if any, people knew what the industry would look like at the end of that five-year cycle. Um, but with that, uh, as we look ahead, you know, we have a, a quote. We want to we want to be able to kind of look at this from from this quote's perspective, which is we can learn from history, but we can also deceive ourselves when we selectively take evidence from the past to justify what we have already made up our minds to do. So, um, you know, there is a book, it's a very ancient book, um, but I highly recommend it to anybody. It's called How to Lie with Statistics. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's kind of part of this lesson. And uh, I also had a colleague once that, that expressed this quote in a different way. Um, his quote was, never let the facts get in the way of telling a great story. So he would always um, come up with his story and then selectively choose facts to support his story. Um, that's not really learning from history. That's simply just uh, justifying and rationalizing our choices by using history. So there's a big difference there. Um, so as we look at currently and where we're going, uh, the question is what will define this century's Roaring Twenties? Uh, you know, the Roaring Twenties is, is well known, the, the 1900s, uh, the 10 years uh, between World War I and uh, the Great Depression was known as the Roaring Twenties, a, a, uh, from all that I've seen and read, a smashing time here in the U.S. Is, as well as in other parts of the world. Um, so here we are living in our own version of the Roaring Twenties. And uh, at the beginning of this year, one could easily say, wow, we're, we're in a similar situation. You know, we're, we're just steaming ahead into this next decade. And uh, yeah, 
then we got to February and March and suddenly the Roaring Twenties had a whole different kind of roar to it. But for right now, um, as we look at uh, the beginning of the Roaring Twenties, if you will, for this century, we're, we're going to kind of put COVID off to the side uh, just for a couple of minutes. Um, we will talk about COVID and, and some of its impact, but uh, for right now, let's just hold it off to the side because the things we're talking about um, and are about to talk about were going to happen, are happening, and will happen um, in spite of COVID or even if COVID never existed. So the first thing I would like to kind of put out there as to where we are as we enter into the Roaring Twenties is that uh, 2019 will likely be remembered as the high point of consumer choice for content. And if you think about all the things we talked about in that poll question and all those different ways that consumers have to uh, consume media, um, it's built upon obviously technological changes and, and a lot of different things that have come into place in the industry. But a big part of it is that up until uh, recently, the industry, as it moved away from control to choice, basically accepted the fact that the best way to maximize uh, consumer interaction and consumers use of content was with a distribution strategy that centered around um, ubiquitous availability of content. That there are so many different ways for someone to consume my content. I want to make sure that it's on as many of those platforms as possible. And as we went through the past 25 years and those platforms changed and expanded, as we talked about in the history of the past 25 years, the studios realized that, okay, uh, more is not less, more is more. And I'm going to put my content out there. Well, funny things happened in the last few years. Um, and, and that is that relationships with consumers have changed as technology has changed. Um, supply chain and the way product gets to a consumer has been changed. And big players in the industry have decided that maybe a ubiquitous distribution strategy is not the most advantageous for our business over the long term. And so, either industry, either uh, players within the industry started their business growth or now are changing their business model to an idea of my distribution strategy should be centered around exclusivity of my content, not ubiquity of my content. And there's a number of reasons for that. And there's a number of reasons to want to have um, an exclusive or an exclusivity around the distribution strategy. Um, and as recently as, um, you know, late last week, if you read some of the interviews from uh, Jason Clark from, from Warner, uh, you know, he made it very clear that he viewed the company as someone who has been in the wholesale business for their content for the past number of years. And that needs to change. Um, so, you know, there's, there's going to be change and that change is going to be driven by uh, this swinging of the pendulum back toward control. Now it will never get to where it was 50 years ago. That's impossible, but, uh, 2019 will definitely be uh, viewed five years from now or 10 years from now as kind of the high point for consumer choice for content. 2020 starts this movement to try to recapture control by, by companies. Um, 
So one of the things that we know will happen is that if you're going to look at exclusivity, that external partners will still exist, but probably shortened windows and, and shortened uh, or, or different types of relationships between uh, external and internal partners with regard to content. Um, and, you know, this exclusivity is where companies are striving for uh, consumer control, not just um, in how they use the content, but this big change is really driven by the need and the want to control and have ownership of the relationship with the consumer directly. And that our industry has basically been driven up till now um, for a lot with, for the most part, based on uh, different distribution partners for content creators. So major players and not major players, organizations within the industry will be focused on verticality. They're going to want to control all parts of the process of developing content, creating content, and then the use of that content. They want to have direct consumer interactions without intermediaries. And that is because data-based decision-making has become more and more important and data tends to be proprietary to whomever has the direct contact with the consumer. So all of the things that we're seeing and, and all of the things that were starting to take place at the end of the last cycle are going to affect this next cycle. You know, so the new streaming services are all built around this concept of recapture control, um, get vertical, interact directly with the consumer, have data to be able to make better decisions, right? The era of big data. Here's the two things that are unknowns in our industry. How do consumers react to companies' intentions? How do consumers react to change in business models? How do consumers react to uh, old players, the OGs, changing? And how do they react to the entrance of new players? All of these things are unknown. We could try to predict it, but they're unknown. The other unknown in our industry, which quite honestly is what made, has made me stay in the industry for as long as I have, is that we are trying to make art into commerce. And our product is art. And the hardest thing I've ever had to do as a salesperson is take art and sell it. Because art by its very definition is subjective. And therefore there is no mass art. Even pop art, as it was known in the 60s and 70s, was not appreciated by everyone. It was a nice new movement, but pop means popular, or well, we're short for popular, but it wasn't mass consumed. So this idea um, of how will consumers react, well, here's the thing. Consumers react differently, not just to the business models, but to the art. And no matter what the business model is, if they don't like the art, it, they'll reject it. So those two unknowns um, are the things that make predicting what will be 
the end of this cycle and what will be the results of the end of this cycle, we're not smart enough to know because those two unknowns are so huge. But here's one thing that we can say pretty confidently. That this next five year cycle will in fact happen in three years. I said this last year that the next five year cycle will be shortened because of how fast things are changing and how quickly um, major players are changing what they're doing. And I will tell you, and, and if any of you were on a presentation I did a few months ago or a few weeks ago to this group or parts of this group, um, COVID is an accelerator. And so um, if I was pretty sure it was gonna happen last year, I'm certain it will happen now because COVID as an accelerator, it will, will help to drive the changes that would have taken place over five years historically, and it will happen within three years. That three years from now, or three years from the beginning of this year. So at the end of 2022, we'll be able to look at that three-year cycle in the same way we looked at those previous five, five-year cycles that we talked about in the first part of the session. And I think that's it for this part, Eric. So if you want to do poll question number two. Yeah, um, let's jump in with that. So uh, launching the poll now, everyone, please jump in and uh, just what you think. Question is, how many new SVOD platforms have you signed up for in the last 18 months? That would be interesting to see. I have a question. Um, for you, Stephen, while we wait on that, um, on the results. Um, you, know, you mentioned that 2019 will be, um, I guess, a high point for consumer choice. And I'm wondering what your expectation is when it comes to the proliferation of OTT channels that are really kind of niche, niche oriented, vertically oriented in terms of the content that they present. Um, you know, clearly that they represent um, a lot of choice, uh, availability of content that might not otherwise be available. Um, what are your thoughts about, about those in terms of the, um, the, the choice available to, to consumers? Yeah, so when we, when we were talking about um, the high point for consumer choice, we're looking at it in the context of a given product. Right. So in any for any single product, whether it be a TV show or a film, 2019 was the time when you would be able to, you know, view it, watch it, interact with it in as many different places as you ever will. There is a question that the choice that consumers have as to what they do with their free time overall and the choice, the choices that they have to go get content will continue to expand at least through the, this cycle and the next cycle, which I would argue would also be another three years. But as with most growth cycles, um, there eventually will be, uh, well, when I first started, they just called it consolidation in an industry. Mm -hmm. So growth, growth spurs growth and choice, and then there's consolidation. Um, I think in the 90s, we came up with a politically correct word, and it wasn't consolidation, it was rationalization. Uh, so I, I think for the, for the foreseeable future, the next two cycles, there's con continued increase in choice as to how to consume different products, but for any single product, mm -hmm. the choice will start to um, contract. 
Yeah, I mean, so once again, I guess we see how content, content is king. Um, you know, the, the various platforms that, that have, um, have emerged have become and, and continue to, uh, to produce um, more innovation in terms of who is delivering the content and how you get it. Um, but over time, you know, in the end, uh, it, it's, content has a lot of power and control. Um, okay, so we have some uh, results to our poll. I'm going to go ahead and share these right now so we can all see them. Um, so you can see how many, again, how many SPOT platforms have signed up for in the last 18 months. Um, so only 9% have signed up for none, 57% um, one or two, and 30% three or four, we had 4%, that being one person, uh, more than four. Um, I have a guess about who that person was. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Stephen. Yeah, so again, um, this is uh, not surprising. There's obviously been uh, several new high visibility platforms that were introduced and there have been uh, dozens, if arguably hundreds, maybe less visible that are available to those that choose to get them. To your point, Eric, about, um, you know, specialized platforms. And uh, again, this will affect change. Um, you know, the, the one thing that is unknown, you know, and, and when we talk about consumers, how they react, um, Uh, to not only the content, but also the business model change is we're basically moving from an industry that had uh, very few all-you-can-eat buffets, if we want to go to the food industry, to an industry that suddenly uh, wants to have an all-you-can-eat buffet on every street corner. You know, so it used to be if you wanted to really kind of indulge in all-you-can-eat buffets, you had to go to Las Vegas. Right. The rest of the world was, uh, you know, just doing it on a transactional basis in restaurants. Well, our industry was like that, but our industry has decided maybe McDonald's should be a buffet. And maybe the local Chinese restaurant should be a buffet. And it'll be interesting to see how consumers react to that. Um, I'm not smart enough to predict it, uh, but I'm smart enough to watch it very closely. Uh, I can still see the poll. Can anybody else? I know. Yeah, you don't want to see that anymore. Let's make it go away. <laughs> so the last section um, of the session, we, we want to take a look at the evolution in the industry and, and how it will affect um, us individually and as well as the organization that we're part of. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully our leaders in. And so again, we want to kind of start this section with a, with a quote that kind of talks about the importance of the section. And, and that is, you have to accept the fact that your choices, uh, every one of them, are leading you to either success or failure in however you define those terms. You know, so this quote is really about um, individual responsibility. And as we look at our careers and as uh, trying to uh, be leaders or develop into leaders, you know, one of the biggest things is understanding individual responsibility. So looking at personal growth, career progression, transition based on what we talked about within the industry and, and maybe some additional things, um, I'd just like to kind of put a few things out there. And, and one is um, there is no substitute for hard work is not a cliche. And, and I think, um, you know, Teresa's presentation, uh, she talked a lot about hard work. Uh, you know, you, you can't succeed without hard work and and as it was, relates to uh leaders and leadership 
I've never, I, I've heard leaders described many different ways. The one way I've never heard a leader described, or maybe I should say the one way I've never heard a successful leader be described is as lazy. So, um, you know, the, the premise is no substitute for hard work. There are no lazy leaders. Um, but so the next part, I was kind of uh, very interested and very, uh, I guess, uh, satisfied to hear Teresa talking about General Galvin and, and some of the things he talked about. And I'm going to reference that in a second. But uh, everybody knows what a silo is. And, and depending on where you work, you might feel like you work where there are silos. Um, so there's definitely silos uh, in companies, but, you know, silos are really something that takes place, you know, out on farms is where we most know them for. Um, silos, as we look at them personally, we need to understand nothing grows in a, in a silo. Silo is for storage, not for growth. So um, you need to look outside of your silo, of your professional silo, if you want to grow. Um, growth requires great knowledge. It also requires broad perspective. Uh, I think the quote was from General Galvin, global perspective. Okay. Um, have a broad perspective if you are only working professionally within your silo. And that silo can be defined as your job. That silo can be defined as your team. The silo could even be defined as your company. If you don't break out of those three silos, it is really very difficult, no matter how much you work to, require, to, to acquire great knowledge, it's hard to get broad perspective if you stay within only those three silos. You have to use resources outside of your team and your company in order to be a better performing leader for your team and your company. And I'm going to just talk about something for me that was very personal. Um, I, I've been very fortunate throughout my career to have some fantastic mentors um, and, and people who, who helped me along the way. And my first true professional mentor um, was someone that, regrettably, I only had the opportunity to work for for seven years. And um, at the end of that seventh year, I actually left the company I was working at, at with him and, and went to another company. And he, he knew um, that I was leaving, and he... And he uh, I'll say he blessed it, right? He, he encouraged it. Um, and he encouraged it for a number of reasons, but not least of which is he knew he was dying. He had terminal cancer. And so he encouraged me to leave and, and to go somewhere. But he also did something for me that I didn't find out about until years later. He took care of me. He went to people he knew within the industry I was in at the time, and he said, help him. You're a friend of mine. I need you to help him. And one of the people that he went to came to me a few years later and said, Steve, you do a great job in what you do for your company. You need to start doing a great job outside your company. And he was at that time... I was in the consumer electronics industry at the time, and he was at that time the chairman of the video division of, of the CEA or the CTA, I guess, as it's known now. 
And I always viewed um, participation in uh, kind of the, the trade group thing as uh, that's something someone else can do. It's a lobbying organization. It's not, so, it's not something I need to do. And he explained to me um, why it was important, or he tried to explain to me. And it wasn't until he told me, Paul would have wanted you to do this. And if Paul was alive, he would have made you do this. So you need to consider it. And that made me consider it. And I got involved with the trade organization. And during the late nineties, I became the chair of the video division of the Consumer Electronics Association at a time when DVD was being launched, high definition was being adopted. And my involvement with that organization allowed me to perform better in my own company because the trade group, in this case, the Consumer Electronics Organization, exposed me. Within my company, I had one mentor. Suddenly, I had multiple people that I could learn from and observe and get things from. And I learned different ways to lead from companies who were doing different things. And, you know, I, I would just tell you that if you're looking for growth and you're looking for leadership and you're looking for help and understanding and you're looking to perform better in your own job, And Mark did not pay me at all to say any of this, <laughs> but get involved in trade groups, other things outside of your company that are related to the industry. It's how you will get a better perspective on what is happening in the industry. And each one of our companies have their own goals and objectives. And you generally you know, work very hard to accomplish those, but it has to happen within what's going on in the industry. And if you're not understanding what's going on around you, it's hard to be completely successful in what you're trying to accomplish. So I would encourage people, use resources outside of your team, outside of your company, outside of the three silos that I talked about to get that global perspective in general Galvin's terms, that will allow you to be a better performer, both as a leader and as a participant within your company goals. Um, in the last couple of minutes, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about some things, and there was a question in the last session about COVID, and, and in the role, of the, the job that I do now and, and the business that I have now in, um, you know, in, in executive recruiting and, and placement, uh, I, I get an opportunity to talk to a lot of different companies and a lot of different uh, industries and, and recruiters in different industries and uh, kind of similar to the cycles, right? Uh, and I agree, we're not in the new normal. We don't know what the new normal is. Nobody knows what will be the post-COVID cycle or even how long that is. But there are some things that are already starting to um, take place and, and things that we can see that as individuals, as leaders, uh, as participants uh, in your company's activities, you really need to uh, at least be aware of. Um, the first, and, and I think uh, Teresa touched on this, uh, mastering the art of managing a remote workforce. There is no question that, um, you know, companies will not look the way they look last year, next year. Um, that companies who would have never considered and were not prepared to have a remote workforce um, have been forced to understand it. And so, um, you know, this idea that all of the people you work with are always going to be in the same place as you are uh, has got to be something that, uh, you know, it's, it's just not a reality for, um, 
for many, many jobs and many companies. Because workers will be remote, it, it's so much easier. You know, it's, it's funny, um, companies actually, when they could travel and when they could have gatherings of their people in one place, uh, you know, used to do team building exercises. And, um, you know, Teresa talked about trust, right? And how you trust people. Um, you know, people used to do these team building exercises when they were together. And, and then hopefully that trust as they went apart to maybe their different regions or different offices, hopefully would stay there. Well, if your workforce or a big part of your workforce is always remote, building trust and collaboration is going to be more challenging um, and is going to require different skill sets and, and a different view of things. Uh, as far as managing the flow of work, uh, again, I think someone touched on this with one of the questions or one of the answers. Family obligations are now meshing more tightly with work requirements. And at least in the very near term, as, as you know, most schools who should have been going back over the next several weeks um, in many, many places will continue remote learning. Um, you know, this idea of uh, work and, and family life being separate is, is almost impossible to imagine. And so um, simplification and predictability and workflow and, and business processes will help to increase um, productivity uh, as well as the ability to meet deadlines. Again, in, a, in an environment where um, we probably won't be working the way we were, um, a lot of feedback um, used to come informally. And, and uh, you know, most people got a lot of feedback um, in informal, you know, the, the hallway meeting, the, the kind of um, going out for lunch. Well, you know, if no one's working in the office, no one's having lunch together. So, so the feedback loops formally and informally that used to exist are going to change. Now the structured feedback loops maybe can be controlled more easily. However, those informal ones um, are going to be hard to recreate. And so you need to work hard as a leader of people uh, and as a leader of team to where you create a cadence where you can have regular discussions about what needs to be improved. Uh, and again, maybe this was happening in your organization before, but it's a lot different doing it in a situation where not everybody has the opportunity to be in the same place at the same time. And that's what I got. Terrific. Thanks, uh, Steve. And we're um, a little short on time now, so I think we're going to cut um, um, cut pretty quickly to our next session. I do want to thank you um, for your your notes about the trade association, though, and um, I think that's this is a really important point. Um, you know, the the industry that we're in is is in some ways it's. I worked at Microsoft and and Amazon and Intel, and um, one thing that I've really noticed about the content space and in entertainment is how uh, kind of codependent um, everything is. And, and you know, it really is an ecosystem and it's made up of relationships and networks and community. And um, I started getting involved in the trade association at, um, at EMA back in around 2008 when I was formerly at Microsoft. And I recognized, I felt anyway, that it was a way to, um, to learn more about what was, what was shaping the industry and to be able to kind of have an opportunity to skate where the puck was going um, as opposed to where it was because of those learnings. And we see so many changes now in the industry where people that were formerly in, in technology are now in, at a content company, which is now a content and technology company. And people that were formerly at one studio are now at a different one or at a technology company. Uh, and the, the lines are definitely getting blurred between what's a technology company and what's a, a content company. So, um, you know, having that community, that network, that uh, 
that can help you understand what's going on and, and give you an opportunity to, uh, to, to, uh, to react to it can be really, really valuable. And we certainly appreciate um, folks uh, participating in OTTX. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you, Stephen, for, um, for your presentation. Terrific um, uh, insights and, and great uh, history lesson as well. It's great to um, have that perspective. Um,